Hi, my name is Loan Register, and uh, as you can see in my channel, I have uh, varied interests, simulation racing, uh, photography, and uh, other hobbies. And um, one of the things that I've uh, taken up here, and I have to give credit where credit is due, Ben Eater has a great series that you need to go visit on his YouTube channel. I'm a Patreon supporter of his channel. You know, please support his channel. He's doing some great work. When I was uh, a kid, um, Apple II's color computers uh, were very common. Well, not very common. They were expensive back then. I mean, uh, uh, not everybody had them, but they were amazing computers. Uh, they were accessible, and it was the start of the computer age, not like the computers we have today. One megahertz was considered fast, and oh boy, when I could upgrade my computer to overclock to two megahertz, my Tandy color computer, and uh, upgrade it from 16K to 32K of RAM, and then do a special hack to get to 64K. Oh my gosh, I was in, in heaven. Well, what I didn't realize back then was that the chips that they were using in that era is one generation above the chips that we're using here in Ben Eater's project. The 74 LS series is, is what I used. As a matter of fact, um, I ordered the uh, Jamico 74 LS series kit um, that basically covers almost all of the chips. Uh, the EEPROMs uh, you're going to have to order separately, and um, the, ROM, the RAM chips you're going to have to order separately. I went a little bit different than uh, Ben Eater. Ben uh, does such a great job of documenting and building this uh, breadboard project that um, I was able to kind of extend it a little bit. So with his help and his great information, um, I actually modified my uh, breadboard CPU to be fully 8-bit. All of my registers are 8-bit. My instruction registers are 8-bit. Uh, my memory is uh, fully 8-bit addressable. And um, actually, uh, eventually at some point, I'm going to take and set it up to be uh, pageable. Um, just as a challenge to kind of see if I can page in different memories. Uh, additionally, um, with his project that uh, he put together with the EEPROM burner, which we used, I used to burn the three EEPROMs that I'm using in the setup that I designed uh, from his project, and I'll describe some slight variations in a minute and then take some close-up pictures. Um, with this EEPROM, uh, it gave me all the information I needed to understand how to access uh, RAM modules or RAM chips that have input-output pins, not separate input and output pins like many of the 74 LS series, like for instance the 74 LS 373s. Um, so uh, yeah, it's an interesting uh, project and an interesting challenge uh, and a, it is a fantastic way to understand the basics of CPU architecture and um, how CPUs today are, um, are built off of the principles that are here. If I'd have known this stuff back when I was a kid, um, uh, I would have cost my parents a lot of money because I'd have been f asking for chips all the time and designing things like this because this is just, it's just a lot of fun. And, you know, I've seen people posting, you know, you know, uh, oh, I could build my own uh, CPU with 74 LS series. Oh, then, you know, why? Well, because it's an exploration into electronics and information. So that aside, let me get in a little bit on some of the things that I discovered that might or might not help you. So... A couple of things that I invested in uh, when, when uh, building this uh, that I didn't have when I started um, is I invested in this Rigol DS1054Z. It's about $349, $299 or $399, I forget. Um, surprisingly uh, affordable and uh, gives you a lot of information. Now, you don't have to have a uh, uh, oscilloscope. This is what this is, an oscilloscope. Um, and uh, but what this does, what this does is it allows you when you've messed something up in the uh, in your uh, breadboard, this allows you to take a peek inside and see what the chips are doing. If you've got full logic levels, if they're um, firing the way that you expect, and so on and so forth, makes a big difference. Um, the other thing I invested in was a Fluke One Seventeen. Um, I did have a Centec from. Uh, Harbor Freight worked just fine, but uh, uh, I wanted something, you know, since I do uh, do electronics um, in various formats and throughout my life I've had a reason to have a multimeter for various things, you know, for instance my air conditioning goes out and I found out that there's a capacitor that is, that is what typically dies and having a, uh, an accurate uh, device that is 
you know, as safe as it can be is something that I wanted to invest in. A Harbor Freight multimeter will get you, you know, it'll, it'll measure zero to five volts, no problem, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I also um, did Ben Eater's hack where I uh, cut into a USB cord and used a Apple uh, power uh, uh, module to power the breadboard. But what I found is that <clears throat> as this got bigger and the um, connections got uh, more and more, the interference or resistance between um, each of my power rails, uh, you know, since in a breadboard you're connecting next to each other, not soldering together, um, I was dropping down to the 3.5 volt range, um, which was causing um, strange errors with the chips themselves. You know, you couldn't, the, the, the voltage isn't high enough for the logic levels to do what they're supposed to do reliably. I guess that's the non-technical way of putting it, at least what I discovered. Um, so I did a couple of things. The first thing I did is I went in and I actually um, used little header pins that you can purchase and laid those out across the edge of the board all the way across and then I soldered power rail pins and you'll see it in the picture the red and white red and uh, black wires going around the edge um, going around the edge of the motherboard uh, so that the theory being is is that once I fed power into the soldered power rails I wouldn't be losing any power or voltage to resistance in the connections, the multiple connections between each of the breadboards, the friction fits that you're doing typically, i.e. all of the voltage would be connecting via soldered pins into a friction fit into each motherboard and not in a serial fashion, so powered by parallel, I guess you would say. So that increased me to about 3.8 volts. I mean, it got me a little bit. It, it definitely um, helped a little bit. Um, the LEDs weren't quite bright enough and stuff like that. Um, so at that point, I started wondering how many amps I was drawing and if the power supply was really rated to be able to support that. And um, that, um, I ended up purchasing this on Amazon, um, $79. Uh, and it is current limiting, gives me a voltage that I can choose. And then when I supply it, uh, that made all the difference. I am now at 4.7 volts on the power rails um, across across the board, and um, have a much more reliable uh, uh, breadboard computer because of this. Um, can you get away with the USB device? Uh, I'm sure you can. Um, as I got more into it, I decided I was going to um, I was going to go ahead and uh, invest in that. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. You can see here um, the lights are going to start going and you know, running right now, it, there's nothing in memory, it's just random garbage, but you can see here, you know, all sorts of neat blinky lights, things are moving around. Um, let me go ahead and turn this up here. So I can speed this up and make it even more blinky, or I can slow it down. And there you can see that right now it's running through, uh, it's running through memory. Um, in this case, it happens to be running through instruction zero, um, just back and forth and uh, doing its thing. Um, there are still a couple bugs in here. I haven't confirmed that it's actually doing what I expect it to do. Uh, just before I started this video, I was actually inputting my first program. Loading register A with zero, loading register B with one, adding it, and then continuing that loop uh, so that I can count up um, on, the, uh, on the display register. Some other things that I modified is, is the CPU control logic. Um, I have a 16-bit uh, or I'm sorry, eight, an 8-bit eight instruction set. So I have 8 bits that I need to deal with. And my microcodes are, um, the longest microcode I have in my instruction set is 6 microcodes. So um, I have 6 microcodes that execute um, and then drive my uh, control lines. Um, and I have two 14-bit uh, uh, wide EEPROMs that um, I use to drive the uh, low uh, order uh, control lines, eight bits of it, and the high order control lines of the uh, uh, computer, the eight bits of it. So you can see here I have 16 bits of control lines. Those are driven by two EEPROMs. This EEPROM is the uh, even addresses. This EEPROM is the uh, odd addresses. So each of my microcodes um, have uh, uh, take up two eight bit memory addresses or a full 16 bit memory address, which is here driven over to here for the full 16 bits. Um, I did uh, change kind of how I think Ben's going to do it. He hasn't released his uh, CPU control code yet. I encourage you to go um, investigate it. 
Ben's data and information is much more technical than mine and he's much more knowledgeable and has a multitude of information for you about 555 timers, 74 series chips, so on and so forth. Um, I did uh, modify uh, my later registers to use the 373. The 373, uh, 74 LS 373 basically takes into account the 74 LS uh, 245 uh, and the um, two uh, uh, 8 bit um, uh, memory chips, I think the 173s. So instead of a instead of two 173s and a 245, you can get away with just a 373. So uh, that was a lot more uh, interesting. Now, uh, I still do have the uh, 173 and 245 uh, versions of the registers up here, uh, just because I think it's important to, you know, kind of know where you came from. Um, and his uh, setup of the project uh, illustrates that quite a, quite a bit. So that is my version of the uh, of Ben Eater's um, uh, breadboard CPU. And uh, uh, I've run a little bit ahead of where he is in the video series and completing my control circuits just because, well, his instructions are so great that I was able to deduce where he was going or at least how I wanted to get where um, he was going. Uh, a lot of this, you know, I just didn't know the information. And once he kind of broke it loose, it kind of gave me ideas uh, on different ways to... to uh, attack the various sequences. Um, so, uh, again, um, the chips that you'll need besides, let's say, the Jamico uh, 74 LS series thing. Uh, I, I don't work for Jamico. I, I don't. They don't sponsor me or anything like that. So I'm not getting paid for any of this. I'm just, you know, recommending what worked for me. Uh, two EEPROM chips, or I'm sorry, three EEPROM chips. Two for the microcodes and one for the uh, four-digit uh, hex or decimal uh, display that I have here. Uh, and then most of the rest. Uh, are the uh, 74 LS series chips that can be that are found in that kit? Plus, I did order just a 28-pin um, DIP RAM chip um, that uh, I figured out how to um, access. And the way I figured out how to access this was based on what Ben Eater did with the EEPROM programmer using a Arduino uh, Nano. And some modifications that I made. Um, I have little um, I have pins that I um, put on the analog lines that I detect high or low. And they tell the um, Arduino programmer, uh, this one here is the one that tells it if it's high to program the chip. This one here is uh, tells it to dump. Go ahead and just pull out memory addresses and put it to the serial line. And then this one here gives me debug mode. So I can go high on this and it'll give me some debugging information about um, uh, various things that I have uh, when I program the chip to do uh, various things. Right now the chip's programmed to either program uh, the microcode chips, of which I need two, they're both programmed exactly the same, uh, or um, to program the um, uh, uh, seven segment, four digit um, LCD display that um, I have set up to either display in hex or display in um, decimal. Okay, hope this helps you out, guys. If you have any questions, um, you know, please let me know. Uh, Again, I recommend um, going and uh, supporting Ben Eater via Patreon. Uh, this here is fascinating to me. I hope it's as fascinating to you uh, as it has been to me. Post questions, uh, set up likes, uh, go ahead and subscribe. Uh, I'd, I'd surely appreciate it. Uh, and certainly go subscribe to Ben Eater. Again, I can't thank him enough for um, giving me the uh, information to get started.